I'll get started. Now, um, I think I'm going to give you guys an additional week to work on your current homework. I don't see um, that there's much point <coughs> in me adding another homework to the stack until you're done with the current one. And um, I'm also planning to turn your test back and let you rework whatever you got wrong for like half credit. So I want you to have this week to do that too. I figure that's plenty, <laughs> plenty to do this week. Um, so I'm going to continue on um, to talk about uh, surfaces and the calculus of surfaces in R3. And um, so I'll remind you that uh, the essential idea here, well, there's really two ways to look at it. You know, there's two ways. Um, I'll say calculus of surfaces. All right, so <clears throat> here's a kind of a, uh, O'Neill likes to draw some kind of picture like, like this, and then he'll throw some holes in there, you know. The surfaces always have like a hole somewhere or another. And, um, but at least for the start of this, we'll, we'll think about the surface inside R3. I mean, that's pretty much what we're going to be doing. And um, so to describe a surface, in R3, we really have two, two main ways to do it, right? Um, well, that's, that's, not, that's not the whole picture, I suppose, but you know, if, if this right here is the image um, of X, right? And so down here, we have like, well, he typically uses U and V for UV space, right? Um, so X is some map from the parameter domain, UV space, right, up here to what we call a, a patch, right? This is a patch on the surface. And so X in, in particular, it is, it's three functions, right? The X function, the Y function, the Z function. Um, and we think of those all as functions of, of U and V, right? So, um, and what is the condition that we insist on for X to be a proper patch? What's a proper patch have? Yeah, proper patch is smooth. Rank, oh, let's see, rank, I was about to say rank two, but that's not quite right. We should say it's regular, right? And regular is a fancy way of saying that, right, the um, partial, partial x, partial u, and partial x, partial v, linearly independent, right? In other words, entirely equivalently, we could say that the Jacobian has ranked rank 2. All right, that's the regularity condition. Um, we, before, we're talking about regular curves, right? A regular curve um, is one with non-zero velocity. We also assume that there are curves were smooth. And I say smooth, but I may sometimes say differentiable. I'm not being super careful about the distinction in those, in those terms. Anything else? Um, I would add that we oftentimes want it to be one-to-one um, -one or injective. I don't remember if that's actually part of the definition in O'Neill or not, but certainly that is something we want. We want a one-to-one, one-to-one one -to -one map, right? Oh, actually it is. That's part of my definition. Yep. So smooth, regular, one-to-one, -one. and also we would like for the inverse to be continuous. Uh, well, yeah, the, the thing is, if we don't have, if we have a discontinuous inverse, then that will lead to ambiguities at where the discontinuity happens. Kind of like we talked about for the sphere map that's naturally induced from the, uh, the polar and azimuthal angles. So 
generally speaking, um, definition M um, subset of R3 is a surface if it can be covered by a set of compatible um, proper patches. All right. Now, um, by the way, this another bit of terminology here, the inverse sensor patch is one to one, right? Its inverse exists, and that inverse map is often called a chart. So the inverse of a patch is a chart, all right? Often called a coordinate chart. coordinate chart. And, and um, I would point out to you that that terminology coordinate chart is in good alignment with what we talked about from linear algebra last time. Because the coordinate charts in linear algebra are mappings from the abstract vector space back to Rn. Just like a coordinate chart here is a mapping from the surface back to R2. And so the, 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 the essential idea here is that a surface is in one-to-one -one bijection. It's one-to-one -one corresponds, one-to-one, -one, it bijectively corresponds to R2, all right? Or at least a little subset of R2. And, um, and those little subset, those little patches, they can be put together in some kind of consistent fashion to get the whole, the whole of the surface, all right? So this forces the surface to be what we would say two-dimensional, right? Um, if you look locally at a surface, we can choose two parameters that uniquely fix a point on the surface. Like you tell me the pair of parameters, I tell you the point on the surface, there's no ambiguity. Now, there's another way to describe surfaces, right? The other way to describe surfaces is as, is as a level set, right? The alternative viewpoint M is equal to G inverse of C. In other words, it's X, Y, Z in R3 such that G of X, Y, Z equals to that constant. So this would be describing M as a level surface, right? Now there are obvious advantages to describing a surface as a level surface. There's a theorem that says that um, M is a um, M is a surface in the technical sense I defined above. If it's defined by a level surface where the level function G meets a certain criteria, right? And the criteria, I mean, this is basically the theorem. Theorem. If the gradient of G is not equal to zero on G inverse of C, uh, then G, you know, G inverse of C defines surface. The proof of that theorem rests on what's called the implicit function theorem, all right? And the way that works, I mean, I can give you a proof sketch. Here's a proof sketch. So suppose the, suppose you have a, and, and I, I think I actually need a little bit more of this. I need, I need some conditions like the, uh, the function G is differentiable near the solution set defined by G inverse of the point C. Like it needs to be, needs to be differentiable near, on some open set containing 
the, um, the alleged surface. But here's a proof sketch. Suppose that the gradient of G is non-zero, right? What's that mean? Gradient of G in this case is, you know, like GX, GY, GZ, right? So if it's not equal to zero, you pick a point, right? Pick a point where it's not, you know, pick a point on the surface, the alleged surface. And since that's non-zero, it's going to be, uh, there must be a component of which this is non-zero at that point. So if we have P, um, you know, an element of G inverse of C, meaning that G of P is equal to C, right? Then there is there must exist at least one of the components that's non-zero. So you guys pick it. Which one do you want it to be? For my proof, which which component has to be non-zero? We can use x. We can use y. You can use z. z what do you want to do? Z. All right. So without loss of generality, g z a p not equal to zero. Right. Great. Now here's the thing. What is, what is calculus, what, what, does, what does the gradient mean to, mean to us in terms of calculus? Like, what does it do? Well, what it does is we can look at g of x, y, z is approximately well, it's actually equal to g of p plus the gradient of g at p dotted with, you know, r minus p. Well, let's say x, y, z. Um, fine, I'll do x minus p1, y minus p2, z minus p3, plus some other term, which I'll call eta. The thing about eta is it's small if we're close to the point, right? Because the gradient allows us to linearize g, right? Now, um, so what we have then is this is c, right? c um, plus, well, gx times x minus p1 plus gy times y minus p2 plus gz times z minus p3, right? Plus this error term, eta. This is just calculus, all right? And so what I can do, uh, and, I'm, and I'm on the surface, right? So what is g of x, y, z equal to as well? equal to c, right? So I can solve this, and this gives me z is equal to what? Um, well, let's see here. Uh, p3 minus gx over gz, um, technically at the point p, all right, times x minus p1, minus gy over gz, at the point P, um, times Y minus P2, and then um, plus this eta term over, you know, uh, GZ at the point P. So what this shows you, all right, is that you can write z, right? So this, this is what? This is a patch. This is a patch for um, g inverse of c near p using u as being x and v as being y. In other words, you can solve for z as a function of x and y. What I'm telling you is really an example of what's called the implicit function theorem. 
all right? And that's all I need. And, and then so when you get into the details and do the analysis on this, you can prove that that, Im those implicit func that implicit function so defined is in fact smooth, all right? That it has the necessary conditions. And as long as you stay local, it's gonna have that injective property that you want. Um, so now you, you told me that GZ was not equal to zero, right? But if like GX was not equal to zero, then you could solve for x as a function of y and z. If gy was not equal to zero, you could solve for y as a function of x and z. So you could always write one of the Cartesian variables as a, um, you know, as a parameter, you can parameterize with respect to the two variables that are, you know, left over once you know that one of the variables has non-zero um, gradient, non-zero partial derivative. Now, but in practice, you don't actually do this when you use this theorem. You don't do this. Instead, when you talk about such surfaces, you just write down the equation and you go about your merry way. You don't even, you don't even actually have to um, you know, exhibit patches right? from this viewpoint. You just write the equation, go, this is, this is a good equation. The gradient's non-zero on the solution set. It's a surface. Great. And that is all you need for a lot of questions, right? I was talking to my brother about this, and um, he more or less said that this is the correct viewpoint. But my brother's an algebraist, so go figure, you know? <laughs> um, we are almost always in here working more in the land of, of the patches and the, the parameterization viewpoint. But we do dabble. All right, I thought I should show you that proof because, well, proof sketch, yeah. All right, so let me um, rattle off a couple of examples, right, in this viewpoint. So can you tell me um, here, m equal to g inverse of r um, squared g of x, y, z equal to, you know, x squared plus y squared plus z squared. What's this? That's a sphere, right? What's the gradient of g? Right, I think I did this one last time that we were doing this stuff, but and is that and that's non-zero on the sphere, right? Because if you have R non-zero, you can't have X, Y, and Z all zero. So that there you go. The sphere is a surface, right? Actually exhibiting the patches that made the, that showed explicitly an atlas for the sphere. By the way, the uh, com uh, a set of compatible proper patches. This basically gives you what's called an atlas. Although I usually I usually think about atlas as it's attached to the concept of coordinate charts. I usually will talk about an atlas of coordinate charts. Uh, but, you know, that's kind of, if you have an atlas of coordinate charts, you can get a set of patches correspondingly. So it's kind of like making that distinction is kind of silly on my part. Another one, you could have um, G of X, Y, Z. x squared plus y squared minus z squared, you know? We talked about this sum. Here the gradient of g is 2x, 2y, minus 2z, right? And here we're in trouble, depending on what we say, what, what level we're at, right? Level zero, there's a little bit of trouble. So like m equal to g inverse zero actually is not a, a surface because of the trouble at the origin, right? So if we wanted to look at a surface that's based on this, we'd actually have to like do some extra work and say these points except not close to the origin or something like that, you know? On the other hand, if instead of putting a zero there, we put like a one, then I think we're okay. What, what, is, what is this geometrically, x squared plus y squared? minus z squared equal to one. What, what is this thing? Hmm. 
Yeah, what is that? What is x squared plus y squared minus c squared? So when I'm, when I'm faced with an unknown surface, what I'll do is I'll look at traces on the coordinate planes, you know? You're like, well, I would just feed it into a computer algebra system and see what it looked like. Well, that's better, but I don't have one here, so we'll have to use the board. So if I, if I put, you know, if I put, um, if I put x equal to zero, what happens? I've got y squared uh, minus z squared equal to 1, right? That's a hyperbola. And if you think about that further, when y is equal to 0, there's no solution. So it's a hyperbola which doesn't cross the y equals 0. Um, so it's a y is z hyperbola doesn't cross y equal to 0. It's got to be kind of like one of these deals, right? I mean, that's just, uh, that, these are both supposed to be in the x equals zero. Sorry, I, I, I have trouble drawing three-dimensionally, you know? So here's like part of it. That's in the z, this is the z equals zero, uh, well, x equals to zero snapshot of it, you know? Um, if we look at uh, y equals to zero, what happens? We get x squared minus z squared equal to 1, right? Same song and dance, right? What happens when we look at z equal to 0? Get a circle? Yeah, x squared plus, yeah, very good, x squared plus y squared equal to 1. So if I look at the, here's my y, here's my x. I get that unit circle, right? And if you start trying to think about all this stuff in your head at once, you can put it together, maybe. Um, what's that look like? Okay, so actually, now that I've done that, what happens when we look at z equal to, say, um, plus or minus 1? x squared plus y squared equal to 2, right? And what if you look at x squared plus, what if you look at z equal to plus or minus z naught, you know? You get 1 plus z naught squared, yeah? So if we look at any horizontal slice of it, right, it's a circle. Circle, 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 circle. The circle of smallest size is on the, the xy plane, right? And so that's like here, right? And those, those hyperbolas are kind of like guiding the radii of the circle. They tell you the radii of the circle stacking up. So it's basically all together, it's something like this. It's a hyperboloid of one sheet. That's what we're looking at. Now, I didn't know that going into it, but we figured it out by taking it apart piece by piece, looking at traces, right? So if you ever teach calculus theory, this is the kind of thing you need to do on your own time, expend some hours, like getting it in your blood so that when you're faced with pesky, you know, high school students or whatever that you'll be facing, you're not, don't let them see weakness, you know? <laughs> Figure it out before class. <laughs> Um, I don't know. Now, great. Uh, so, question, is this a surface? Well, if we use the theorem, I think we can see it's a surface, right? Because can this gradient of G ever be zero? Right, you can't get zero, zero, zero. Origin's not in this thing, right? The only place the gradient zero is at the origin. And we could, we could easily plug in the origin to the equation, see it doesn't work. So, different question. What's the, parameter, what's the parameterization of this surface now that we know what it looks like? 
can you find me, is this a simple surface? What was a simple surface? Yeah, is there one regular patch which can cover the whole, probably not. <laughs> Right. I guess here's a slightly less greedy question. Can we cover most of this with a single patch? How about this? X of U V equal to, all right, so what I do when I think about this is I think I want the X squared, I mean, let me, tell, let me explain to you my, my internal thinking on this. I got X squared plus Y squared minus Z squared equal to one, right? So I know that I need cosh and cinch involved because I got a difference of squares. So I'm going to want the x and the y to become a cosh squared, let's say, v. I'm going to want that z to be a cinch squared v. Um, so what that then tells me I want x to be like uh, cosine u cosh, and I want y to be like a sine u cin a cosh. Here it is. So cosine of u cosh v uh, sine u cosh v uh, but a bit of cinch v that is in fact a that actually does parameterize the whole of the surface if we drop if we can just be like drop some of our legalism for a second here and forget about this pesky requirement of one to one, and maybe in, maybe while well, the inverse existing, you know, if I <laughs> there's there's a trouble with going sine and cosine all the way around. The trouble is it's the same as the trouble we had for the polar coordinates. It's when that angle here, the angle u, meets back where it started after two pi. You know, um, but that is a parameterization of this thing. Um, so what I'm, all right, so in particular, in particular, like, what, where is um, u equal to, uh, u equal to zero, where is that? In this, in my picture, I'll, I'll draw another picture over here. So u equal to zero is, that's one, that's zero, that's three. And so I think what happens is the y is zero. It's going to be like this. I don't even know how to draw it on this stupid thing. But something like that. u equal to zero, right? It would be like here. Kind of. I don't know. My, my picture isn't great. Uh, the, 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 really, the, the x-axis should go through that, wherever that is, yeah? But it's got equation x squared. I think it's worse. It's z equal to plus or minus the square root of one of, of, of x squared minus one. So it's not a parabola. It's oh hey, I was I was worried all of a sudden you were a person who'd find out I was using this room without permission. These many, these many weeks. I mean, of course, I've asked permission. Don't listen to anybody who says I haven't, especially me. Um, but anyway, so that that's u equal to zero, and then as u as u ranges, right? You're gonna you're gonna kind of like. What happens is as u ranges from 0 to 2 pi, you kind of go, 
do, 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 and you kind of swing back around. So the trouble is that this one line corresponds to u equal to zero and u equal to, I mean, I say line, but I mean curve. This u equal to zero curve, it corresponds both to u equal to zero and to two pi, letting v vary. And that, that's a discontinuity. I mean, that's a, that means that the, the inverse can't exist for one thing. It's not one to one. And it's going to spoil the continuity of the inverse. Even if I like just keep zero, but delete two pi, right? That doesn't fix it. Because then the inverse, if I, if I keep zero, but I get rid of two pi, then when I look at the inverse function, there's a jump. There's a discontinuity corresponding to that angle degeneracy. But anyway, there it is. That's, that's a parameterization of this hyperboloid of one sheet. Okay. Uh, another example I wanted to just make explicit, because I thought it would be good for us. You, you, Audric, you and me were talking about this a little bit. I wanted to actually show, build a ruled, a ruled surface based on a helix. All right, so let's do that. Um, So definition, so given, uh, what was it, beta? So beta from like, let's say I, a subset of the reals, to R3, and delta, a function from I, a subset of R to R3, can you make x of u comma v equal to beta of u plus v delta of u, um, this uh, to define a quote unquote ruled surface, right? And um, if you actually look at this, it, the part of the reason it's called a ruled surface is you could actually imagine rulers on the surface if you can visualize it in the right way. Um, see, because, well, let me just, let me, let me foolishly attempt a picture, very foolishly attempt a picture of this. And um, I think he, I think O'Neill mentions to think of it in terms of like a vector field or something. And I, I understand why that's said. So if beta, if I draw, let me draw beta here for a second. All right. So here's beta. All right. And let me draw delta as if it was a, um, um, I'm going to move. I'm going to move delta to the, to the point on the curve corresponding to beta of u. That's actually what the formula for the parameterization is, right? It's like, go to beta of u and then add a scalar multiple of delta of, delta of u, right? Delta of u, I think, is the ruling, right? OK. Um, so you know, if this is, if, if, if this is delta, looks like this. Then essentially it's just kind of extend, extending these as you go. And you, if you, these, these blue lines you can actually think of as rulers with direction vector delta of u. And as the v varies from zero, right, you're going to get into trouble if you don't limit v, right? Because what's going to happen if you extend these too far back, they're going to, they're going to intersect, right? Or they might. Um, actually, it's kind of hard to see three-dimensionally, but, you know, if we, if we, we, we have to choose v to be sufficiently small as to not get into trouble, all right? So, I actually want to construct a ruled surface um, based on the Frenet frame, based on the Frenet frame for the helix. 
I think we could do that. That would be maybe an interesting example to look at. Incidentally, on my list of things to do is to type up another chapter of my notes. Like, I want to try to add some of my own thinking about O'Neill's surface examples. And I have a few other books that have more examples of surfaces. I think it'd be nice to have more written. Um, although, I will say, if we just did all of the homework in Chapter 4, we'd have a really solid understanding of what a surface is and how they work and stuff. You'll notice that my solutions to Chapter 4 are pretty sparse, right? So um, I think when I was preparing this course the first time, at the point in the semester, I kind of went like, <laughs> you know. Um, but before this point, I had tons and tons solved, right? Okay, so let's do a rule. Let's do the ruled surface, but for a helix, right? Quick. I'm going to do ruled surface helix edition. So what's the uh, parameterization of a helix? How about this? Beta of u is how to go. Cos u, sine u. What slope do you want to give the helix? How about slope 1? Sound good? So u. <laughs> there we go. So this is a helix with slope 1, radius 1, just usual, you know, usual plug and dance. Picture of this essentially this. What's that? The helix never crosses itself. This is just an artifact in my picture. But it will cross itself unless we're careful. I mean, uh, well, I guess. Might not. I haven't told you how I'm going to choose the ruling yet, have I? So we do this, then um, beta prime is what? Um, minus cos minus sine cosine 1. And then um, so beta prime prime is minus cosine u minus sine u 0. And that is the one. I'm going to make this my delta. I'm going to make that my delta of u. All right? So in other words, I'm going to use the, nor the Frenet normal for my, to make up my delta, make, him, make up my ruling. Um, so what's this, what's this fancy schmancy formula look like? X of uh, uv beta of u plus v delta of u. For my chosen formulas, we got what? Cosine of u, sine u, u plus v times what? minus cos u, minus sine u, 0. So here we go. Formula. We've got ourselves a cosine of u. Well, let me write it this way. We have 1 minus v times the cosine of u times um, pre comma um, 1 minus v times the sine of u. and then u. That's a kind of neat new surface. And uh, I think if we, let, if we let v range from, let's say, you know, um, if we let v range from, say, 0 to 0 to 1, that's easy enough to, let's, let's say, you know, uh, 0 less than or equal to v, less than or equal to 1 for the sake of discussion. I mean, you could make it strictly less than just to get myself out of trouble. Um, so the, 
let's see here, the beta curve. I can't ever draw this worth anything. If I could try to attempt, attempt to draw, <laughs> attempt to draw this thing. I don't know. I'm trying, guys. So <clears throat> this is beta, right? And the um, oh man. So I think the ruling, the ruling is actually like this, right? I'll just draw a couple of sample ones. Here's like the ruling. You know, it's, I, I've kind of excluded that point. Ooh, I have to, I have to, maybe I have to go from like, let me go from minus one to one for the sake of not being so weird. I'll go minus one to one. That way, the ruling would go like almost to the origin and then back here, right? That's the first one. This one would be like be like here to here. Um, let's see here. So if I was so foolish as to attempt to draw it, it's like. I can't. <laughs> I'm trying, guys, but it, it's just it's outside the limits of my artistry. It's 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 it's, it's, it's like a spiral ramp, essentially, is what it is. I mean, it's it's following the heel. I mean, it, this would make the helix the middle of the road, and it's just like lying. Um, you know, uh, I wish I had some wire or something. Maybe maybe I'll have a better. Maybe I can draw. Maybe I can draw it better if I make my range of v smaller. Let me try again. Um, oh, here, this one was pretty good. So if I made the v real small, it would just be kind of like this. The direction of this, these little rulings, they're pointing directly at the z-axis. If my picture doesn't, I mean. Drawing in 3D is always a, a trick, right? But if I was doing justice to it, the rulings should always be pointing at the z-axis. And so it's this is the ruled surface, the little yellow, I mean little orange things here, those are the rulings. So it's not hard to see that this opens up just whole new vistas of examples, right? Because you, you take any curve, take the Frenet frame, right? Pick your favorite like binormal or uh, normal, and just make a ruled surface using that. Yeah. Although these, these do seem kind of boring, there may be things that are true about the rule, geometry of ruled surfaces which are not generally true about other surfaces. I'm pretty sure I remember there being homework problems later in O'Neill that are specifically for ruled surfaces, you can say special things about them. It is a kind of boring formula, right? Because the V dependence is, you see the way the parameter enters? The V parameter only enters linearly as a multiple of the function of U. This is very, very special as you think about all possible ways a formula for V could be constructed. So, eh. Anyway, so I just wanted to get us started here, just to take some time to look at some examples of surfaces. I think it's important. Um, <clears throat> but now that we have that, I want to start talking about the calculus of surfaces, all right? So we're, I'm going to take just like a three-minute break to go grab some coffee, and then when I come back, we'll talk about how to calculate, like what's the tangent space to a surface, how to talk about mappings from one surface to another, and all the, the rest of the calculus part of this chapter. So, I'll be right back.